drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I say it. Okay, stand by. <laughs> All right, stand by. Okay. Let's just get that agenda up. There. Okay. Thanks, Casey. There you go. Good morning and welcome. It is Wednesday, May 11th, 2022. And this is the regular public business meeting of the Lincoln County Board of Commissioners being carried live on YouTube and recorded for later availability on the county website. Commissioner Jacobson and I are present today, constituting a quorum of the board. Commissioner Hunt has an excused absence. And we have uh, starting off a uh, resolution proclaiming May 2022 as treatment court week in Lincoln County. And I'd like to invite our presenters to come forward, please, while I read the proclamation. And this is something just I'm going to say personally, I feel deeply about it was back in about 2006 that uh, Rob Bovet, LaLaurie Lager and I convened the work group that uh, ended up making the successful application for our first treatment court, drug court. And I have heard so many stories from drug court graduates about the opportunity it has given them to regain custody of their children and put their lives back on track. So, whereas treatment courts have been restoring lives and families for more than three decades, whereas there are now nearly 4,000 treatment courts nationwide, and five in Lincoln County alone, whereas treatment courts have served 1.5 million individuals nationwide, the 472 in Lincoln County alone, whereas they are the cornerstone stone of justice reform sweeping the nation and are now recognized as the most successful justice system intervention in our nation's history, whereas treatment courts significantly improve substance use disorder treatment outcomes, substantially reduce addiction and related crime, and do so at less expense than any other criminal justice strategy. And whereas treatment courts improve education, employment, housing, and financial stability, promote family reun reunification, reduce foster care placements, and increase the rate of addicted mothers delivering babies who are fully drug free. And whereas treatment courts facilitate community wide partnerships, bringing together public safety and public health. And whereas treatment courts demonstrate that when one person's one person rises out of substance use and crime, we all rise. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Lincoln County Board of Commissioners do hereby proclaim May 2022 as Treatment Court Month in Lincoln County, recognizing the significant contributions that the Lincoln County Drug Hope Mental Health and Wellness Court Family Support Court and DV Court have made toward reducing substance use, crime, recidivism, and reuniting families, all while saving valuable resources and saving lives. Good morning, welcome. If you introduce yourselves, and the floor is yours. Sure, so I'll just introduce myself. I'm Cheryl Lockhart, I'm the presiding judge. Um, I also have the um, honor of presiding over um, drug court, hope court, and domestic violence court. Um, so I'm three of the treatment courts in the back of the courtroom is Judge Buckley, who presides over <laughs> mental health and wellness court. And most importantly, seated next to me is Megan Boston Terry, who is our treatment court coordinator and truly the backbone mm -hmm. of every treatment court um, in our jurisdiction. So thank you for the recognition, the proclamation of treatment court month. We do have a uh, an event that I think we've been sent out invitations electronically. We also have some copies. We are doing an event May 24th, make sure I get the date right, at 9 a.m. Um, 
we originally had planned it for our courtroom, and the good news is um, we have so many participants now in our treatment courts and other people that wanted to attend. We couldn't accommodate as many people as we needed. So um, the Performing Arts Center very generously allowed us to use their space. So um, it's going to be a fun event. We're recognizing since we haven't been able to do this for three years, we have some awards to give out recognition for people uh, working in the recovery community. And we get to give out three years um, worth of awards uh, for recognizing uh, people's other people's contributions to um, our treatment courts and the recovery community. So we're excited. It'll be a fun event. We have past and present participants that will be there. But uh, Megan can talk about the display that she made in my courtroom, the courtroom 305. Yeah, so in courtroom 305, we have stars um, to represent each person who graduated one of our treatment courts. So since 2006, as we've been having graduates, there's 244 stars, I believe, and they have each person's first name on them. And so a bunch of us hung up yesterday. So it's really cool if you have a chance to stop by Judge Bachart's courtroom room 305 on the third floor and just kind of look at them. It's, it's amazing to just see everyone represented there and how many lives we've impacted. That's wonderful. Yeah, I'm going to go check it out. Yes, Me too. it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Jacobson, comments or questions? The only um, comment I was going to make is back to the um, proclamation you read on um, you know, reducing foster care placements and increased rates of addicted mothers who are in reserve, fully drug free. Um, I've been a foster parent for many years, and um, years ago I had a, a <coughs> child come um, to care. been born and drug free because mother had been in treatment court. over his drug court judge and admitting he was skeptical at first he thought it was you know the latest hug a thug mentality but he was pleasantly surprised when he really came to understand deeply how the treatment courts work i don't know if i was um i don't know if i was skeptical mm -hmm. um i enjoy it more than i ever thought i would i wouldn't do this job if i didn't like people and I just said this morning in a proceeding, I wouldn't do this job if I didn't think people could change. What treatment court does is it does give you an opportunity as a judge to connect with people. You usually see them for 15 minutes, you know, during a sentencing proceeding and just seeing them repeatedly. And it goes both ways. They, um, for participants, sometimes it's the first time they've had positive interactions with a judge and you do get to develop a relationship you get to hear about their struggles and what's going on in their lives and their day-to-day -day, um and um life um and so i've really come to appreciate that because you do connect with them um you just can't not you see them a lot <laughs> um it take it is time consuming it takes a lot of resources and it you can't do it alone it's the team um, Ms. Kale, who is the attorney in the back of the courtroom mm -hmm. for um, um, drug court, um, it's a huge time investment. And I've been truly humbled getting to work, not just with the participants, but everybody in the recovery community. They are some of the most dedicated individuals that I've ever encountered. They do this because they care. And um, it is important work. So on that note, um, last time I was here, um, I was invited to participate in a work group, and I haven't been contacted about that. Nobody's been contacted about that, and I think it was supposed to occur this month. 
Yeah, so I just had a chat last week with Florence Portal. I think she yeah, and I had, had breakfast. Yeah, with her said, week, right? yeah, because we decided to just do it ourselves. Yeah. And nobody else was going to do it. So um, I was kind of working on a design. She was working on a design. And so I think we had kind of two groups working on pulling it together. So um, we decided we should probably, you know, be, be in more coordination with each other instead of both trying to do something. So we're kind of in the process of um, merging those ideas. Uh, in fact, I have an email from her I got this morning that I need to return. And um, the thing we had talked about, which I think was good, is instead of us, um, us the county, trying to completely take it on ourselves and be bringing in um, a third party or a professional facilitator so that we all can be participants in that and not be trying to run the meeting ourselves and also be a participant. So she was going to look at who might be you know, a partner or a party you could bring in that, um, you know, didn't have skin in the game themselves because we want all of our partners to really participate and not be also trying to run the meeting. Um, so I think that's the direction we're going is trying to, you know, pull someone else in from another county or something that can maybe provide that kind of facilitation for us um, so that everyone in our community can fully participate. So it's still definitely happening, I would say. Yeah, we kind of had several cooks in the kitchen, I think we're it came down to just you know having one yeah blue who had you contacted because i i've been trying to get, get those people same people together in terms of participants yes <laughs> yeah so i hadn't reached out to anyone um, yet i actually used that dry erase board and designed a process with all the participants and okay. i guess because we've been contacting people and we said what about the work okay. group and, and nobody has and heard four and say can have done something similar so our next step or had come up with a list okay we, we came up on that list together so i need to send her my list so that okay we can compare the two okay yeah. all right, right. Okay, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so, thank you. Thank you both. I'm ready for a motion now. Oh, um, I will make a motion that we proclaim May 2022 as Treatment Court Month in Lincoln County. I'll second that motion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 It's approved. Okay. Thank you thank again. You very much. Next, we move to adoption of the consent calendar. These are routine items such as contract renewals or items that have been discussed at previous meetings. Is there any request from Commissioner Jacobson or staff to remove or highlight one of these items? Uh, no. So I will make a motion that we adopt the consent calendar as presented. All second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 It's approved. Now we move on to the bid award for the Sturdivant Road Asphalt Overlay Project. I don't see Mr. Kenyon here, but uh, <clears throat> we did thoroughly discuss this at last week's meeting, I believe, or two weeks ago. Chair, oh, oh, he's oh, okay. Rise online, okay. Yeah, we're having video issues, Chair, but I believe we should be able to see Roy at least. Are we here? Roy, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. All right. Is there anything that you wish to add or uh, review with regarding this bid award? Um, I don't believe so. Uh, this is Roy Kenyon, Lincoln County Public Works Director. Um, last week I presented um, our uh, project, the Servant Road Overlay Project. Um, we did discuss. Um, the reasoning for the, the huge difference in the, the bid amounts. And like I said before, it all basically boils down to the, the cost of fuel. Um, and other than that, everything is pretty well straightforward. This is the project that we're going to um, attempt to get done before the school year starts. So this will be in August of this year project. Um, that will actually help with the, the mass of, of school goers because there are actually an elementary school and a high school on that stretch of road. So other than that, um, I don't really have anything else to add. All right, any questions, Commissioner Jacobson? No, I think as you um, said, we had pretty thoroughly went over that last time, so. All right, I'd be ready to entertain a motion then. Okay, I make a motion um, to award a bid for the Studerbant Road Asphalt Overlay Project to Road and Driveway. I'll second that motion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 It's so ordered. Thank you, Roy. You're welcome. Okay, we move on to uh, 
discussion and information items. Uh, and um, is Councillor Urbich online? Jerry, you with us? I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? We, hear we can you. hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. So this is an ordinance amending our previous mass gathering ordinance in the county code. And you and uh, Planning Director Husing are here to make that presentation. Well, thank you very much, um, Chair and Commissioners. This is Jerry Herbage. Um, I'm Assistant County Counsel working for Kristen Ewell in the Office of County Counsel. And I'd like to briefly give a presentation on this ordinance. But before I do so, uh, this is a first reading. And I would ask the board if we may read by title only. I am okay with that. I am as well. Amendments. Thank you. Amendments to ordinance for number 495 codified in sections 4.505 to 4.610 as mass gatherings, small, outdoor, and extended to the Lincoln County Code. So that's the title. Uh, what I would like to say about this is that I think obviously through the years, the board has had a number of accomplishments. But in 2017, I think the Board of Commissioners did something uh, very important in my opinion, and that was the adoption of Ordinance 495. And that would require permits for small gatherings, outdoor mass gatherings, and extended mass gatherings under the terms of the ordinance. The reason why I say that is that the Oregon revised statutes do not regulate small gatherings, although they allow local jurisdictions like Lincoln County to regulate them. Uh, excuse me, Jerry, just a clarifying question before you go on. What is the threshold for a large gathering regulated by the state versus a small gathering regulated by us? Okay, um, thank you for that question. Um, a small gathering, and this is in the definition section um, of the ordinance before you, but a small gathering a second, is I'm just pulling it up here. Jerry, do you need me to scroll on my end? No, I, I've got it here. Thank you. Uh, less than 3,001 persons, but more than 300 persons for a period of time that is expected to continue for more than six hours, but not more than 120 hours. So in the past, the counties had like maybe three of these a year before COVID and um, all of them have Fall, uh, fallen under the definition of small gatherings. And each of these, and it was a good question, Chair Hall, because each of the different types of gatherings have different procedures. The mass gathering, which is regulated by the state, is for 3,001 or more persons. And uh, so, uh, and then and then up to 120 hours in length. And then the extended mass gatherings is over 120 hours in length. The extended mass gatherings are land use decisions, which involve more process than all of the others. The mass gatherings um, are not, unless the county wants to so designate them, and we haven't. They are not land use decisions, but they require a permit and a certain amount of procedure. And those permits are approved by the Board of Commissioners. The small gatherings is an expedited process. Those are approved by the director. So that's the background on that. But my point that I was making is these permits are important because they regulate health and safety. 
So in order to get a permit for these large gatherings, the applicant needs to file a permit for a permit that includes information very important on things like sanitation or sewage, uh, food preparation, how's that done, uh, traffic control, um, you know, various uh, safety issues and so on. So that that's all covered by the permit application. And so before the board adopted this ordinance, we did not have regulation of small gatherings. And that's why it was, I think, it's somewhat monumental and important action of the board back in 2017. The point is, is that, uh, as I said, we've had these uh, large gatherings in the county. And when we say large gatherings, they have to be largely outdoor. If they're indoors, then this does not regulate them. Um, and um, so in the ordinance that we have, 495, section 4.610 provided that by December 31, 2018, the Lincoln County Board of Commissioners will review the ordinance for possible amendments. And so on December 5th, 2018, Planning and Development Director Anno Husing issued a report based on his experiences in processing these applications. And I'll let him largely go over his experience on that. But uh, the board received a report on how the ordinance was working and the board took public comment on December 12th of 2018. Then what happened is the process was delayed because the 2019 legislature took up mass gatherings through House Bill 2790 and then COVID happened. So this has been tabled uh, for a period of time and it's being resurrected now that COVID is over and we expect, well, I say COVID is over, the, the pandemic in a sense is over, COVID may be with us uh, for a very long time, but uh, these events may be occurring in the future again. And so the idea is let's get back to this. Um, maybe director using, cause you know, as you kind of use the timeline there, you know, we were working on this. I think the county actually had already started working on it when I came here in 2019. And then, like you said, the legislature was working on it, COVID, and now here we are. So maybe Director Husing in like just two minutes could, <laughs> or three, um, could you just really briefly, oh yes, we have a timer now on us. Um, could you just tell us like, because I think there's a lot of people in the audience that maybe weren't with us three years ago or whatever. So how did this issue kind of come up in the first place? I mean, like, what we're, you know, I, I know there's a story. So in a couple of minutes, you know, why were we initially kind of taking this on and needed to look at it? I think you that mind if I chime in, Commissioner? Sure, as well. yes. Uh, we started getting multiple complaints and concerns about, uh, gatherings in the uh, 300 to 3,000 range and one that stood out particularly there was actually someone on their land in Lane County was holding an annual so close to the Lincoln County board. yeah very close and it was Frank Frankie Petrick the Ahots fire chief who took me out there and though this property is in Lane County it's actually part of the uh, Yahats Rural Fire Protection District. And then after, I believe, was it you, Mr. Husing, who showed me the video? Now, this was late summer, very dry time, and they had built a Burning Man type of effigy. And when they lit it off, uh, sky rockets were flying into well, the surrounding forest. Uh, for the record, on a Husing, Director of Planning. Um, and that's how the story really begins, mm -hmm. is that I'm pretty new here. And this is 10 years ago. We start hearing about from our friends up Five Rivers that there's this kooky stuff happening really close by. And to get to that part of Lane County, I guess you got to go through Lincoln County to get there. Mm -hmm. And so we started. So the, the narratives 
that started coming from our, our colleagues and friends and, and your constituents up in Five Rivers is there's some nutty, dangerous stuff going on. It was Burning Man Portland. It wasn't Burning Man like. It was Burning Man Portland what was one of the events. And so these people, these property owners in Lane County, had established their rural property and re on resource lands as a weekly event center. And so each week there, so people are experiencing uh, in their rural area, all of these people coming up there on this regular basis. The, the most, the craziest one, of course, was Burning Man Portland. And there's a bunch of stories that I don't have time to talk about, but they were shocking about the dangerous nature of these things. Uh, I appreciate your leadership at the time because the, the two of us basically, in, in response to your constituents, interacted with what our colleagues of Lane County and asked them to, because they were, they were ready to issue a conditional use permit to authorize this on a regular basis. And ultimately, uh, Mona Linstenberg and others up there uh, went to Luba over this, and there was a very important opinion, a Luba opinion, that said you can't take resource lands and make event centers out of them. And so then I started hearing from our friends in Five Rivers, well, I don't know, there's, there's a festival happening in Lincoln County that happens up in Tidewater that happens every summer. A large one. And so um, at that point, because how insanely dangerous some of these things are and how tremendously impactful they are for the neighbors, that's when this whole discussion about, you know what, and coming off of the Luba opinion that we decided, you know, we really need to, and, and other jurisdictions, you know, this became a business model for people to hold events out in rural areas and all these people would come and and so that, that's really the genesis of that. And, and I'm proud of your leadership at the time. And I think people up there appreciated that we stepped in and, inter, and intervene, which we don't normally do in a land use matter for another jurisdiction. And that, that turned out okay, the Luba opinion. So that's, that, that was really the impetus for us to establish our own set of parameters about how we would, because this is one of the most interesting things about all this. And, and uh, Jerry Herbert knows this too. You get every 90 days, if you have a rural property, irrespective of the zoning, if you want every, once every 90 days, you get to hold a mass gathering. We, we can't tell them no. And so, yeah, the weekly event center, that was no, but once every 90 days, somebody on their property under Oregon law, we're obligated to follow it, uh, can hold one of these things. And that's why that, that really was, that those were the, the issues that made us jump into this arena and 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 create this regulatory structure. One thing I know I just figured there's also people watching or whatever that maybe don't know the history. So yeah. I just wanted to Yeah, no, I think and, and I was looking that. forward to being up because I think that's that was great. And I remember the other piece of history that I'll share, and this is basically my presentation more than anything. So you know I don't, I don't think we have I don't have to double dip or triple dip on this. But remember Katie, when you first came on board, there was a uh, a motorcycle rally that was being permitted up Schooner Creek, right? Yes, a a yes, mass gathering. Yes, uh -huh. And the neighbors were not enthused. No. And they were contacting you, they were contacting me. And, and, and my experience with this is sometimes when it, when, it, when it was Beloved Presents up in Tidewater, they were very professional. They, I mean, they had a professional event coordinators from Colorado involved, and, and they had extraordinary. Uh, systems in place to try to have a, a big gathering like that in person. I went to several, it was impressive. At the other end of the spectrum, most of the people we're dealing with, good luck trying to get them to provide us any kind of information. We had to babysit them and, and drag this information, kicking and screaming. And so you're, yep. remember I when you called out, me, go ahead. I actually yeah. went out to someone's um, house in Schooner Creek several years ago um, when that event was setting up, not on their property, but in their adjacent property, you see the proximity and the noise and that kind of stuff. And so um, this is like, this, I'm, I'm channeling my inner auto here and telling a story, but a funny story about that is I was at this person's property looking at it. Um, I realized that they raised organic pigs. And so I still work, uh, buy a pig from this person every year <laughs> after, going out there, outcomes, right. outcomes, <laughs> after going out there to um, see their property and where this event was, in, which was very close um, yeah. to their property and egg conservation. And um, they're definitely, because there's cut there on a creek there, Spooner Creek, there was a lot of safety concerns around what was happening to the waste. From all these people. But if you recall, there. Commissioner Jacobson, yeah. your central observation that made its way into this draft ordinance was the folks said, 
where's our opportunity to get notice about this in advance and potentially you know weigh in on this and that that was your central insight that you communicated to us and i think really animated the desire because that's the heart of if you look at our ordinance here what's so what's different right what what do the proposed changes do the proposed changes would lengthen the time frame it would actually make the people that are thinking about doing this, they, they need to submit this stuff 120 days in advance, not 90 days in advance, not some rush job at the end. And that also gives us time to provide notice in the paper. So we, we beefed up the ability for people to weigh in and, and, and provide and get notice to the public about these events so they don't just go wake up one morning and all of a sudden there's all this stuff going on next door to them. Uh, Mr. Urbich, would you like to go through the changes and highlight any of them? I would, and thank you very much. So uh, let's look at this document um, and the changes, the primary ones are as follows. Uh, what Anno had just mentioned, 4.515 sub six, the organizer has to file the application at least 120 days instead of uh, 90 days before the small gathering, mass gathering or extended mass gathering. And furthermore, uh, on the notice that is expanded for small gatherings and small gatherings, which I indicated has been what our applications have been so far on small gatherings. Now there is a required uh, 14 day published notice and also notice to abutting owners. Um, so that is uh, what uh, Commissioner Jacobson had requested, and that is included within the changes. Um, if we move on, uh, some of these are more cosmetic, but, um, you know, 4.530 sub 5, the director is to consider public input. And that is the public input that will get... Uh, after the publication of the notice and the notice to the neighbors. Uh, we um, struck the language that said insurance may not be cancelable because apparently that does not exist in the real world. That's um, we, you know, some of it's just language changing, approving to reviewing because really the people who like the sheriff or the health department don't really approve. They make review and someone else makes a decision to approve or not. Then uh, a few others, uh, 4.565, the organizer should consider no parking signs in areas where it is appropriate to do so. 4.580, security operators may operate 24-7. 585 um, and uh, so the, is the organizer is to provide the director that's on with total count of persons within 10 days of the event 4.610 we had a, a the, the date in 2018 for review so now it just says that there should be periodic review of the ordinance to see how it's working and um, let's see what else here. I, I want to say one other thing that before we bring it back to the board, I reviewed all this work, went to the statutes. Um, I am going to, at your next reading, I'm just gonna include some statutory language from ORS 433763, um, basically, for extended mass gatherings, this may never happen in the county as this requires the event to have more than 3,001 people and the event goes for more than 120 hours. But there's uh, a few lines of statutory language for any of these that become land use. We haven't had any that have been land use before. We haven't had any extended mass gatherings. But just so that we're consistent with the ORS, I will include that in the language that we submit. That's under 4.530. Um, I'll just modify that slightly, just include the ORS language in there, and that will be at the second reading. Uh, 
So those those are the changes. I appreciate the opportunity to go over those. I would ask the board to see if there's any public comment as this is a first reading. And then I would ask the board to either by consensus or motion um, have this come back before you in two weeks time. Thank you. Uh, one other piece of historical context that might be helpful for people who didn't follow the original process of adopting this ordinance. Why the range of 300 people to 3,000? Well, 3,001, the state regulation kicks in. And I recall we had some public testimony, some board discussion about what the lower threshold should be. And by saying essentially no, licensing regulation kicks in until you're exceeding 300. That was to not be overly burdensome to things like weddings, church group gatherings, family reunions, that kind of thing. As long as they don't become regular events for hire, so a property right. is being turned into an event. So, like right. one, it's, yeah, it's one to, event. so it's meant to be yeah. an event yeah. and a one-off. Yeah. And, 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 and the decision was made, you know, we really don't want to get into that. Mm -hmm. Right. Have so, a, you know, one wedding or something at your property. Yeah. yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. We we covered these somewhat in four point five one zero exclusions, and it indicates that these permit requirements do not apply to any regularly scheduled religious service or religious organized activity that takes place on institutional property, regularly organized and supervised school district activities or programs that take place on school property, any activities on the Lincoln County fairgrounds or commons, any activity at a county park, or any activity of a municipal corporation or government agency. Those are the exclusions. Would you agree, Jerry, that those exclusions are there because there are other regulatory means and oversight in, in, under those circumstances for, for those, those particular settings? That that is right. That I think that's exactly right. The the kinds of activities that we've taken, uh, that you've issued permits for, and you've actually been very busy in past years before COVID, is that um, you know a large gathering, generally in a quite an outdoor setting, out in the boondocks somewhat, um, and. Um, you know, where there's a large number of people and there is a need for the health and safety regulations, in, including, as you indicated, fire, which is uh, a, a big thing because these events generally occur during the summer or during the dry season. Thank you. And since this is the first reading of Ordinance 526, I would like to request if there is any public testimony. Sure. Do anything. No. Yeah, can we make sure we ask for the hand raise if anybody does want to speak, but there does not seem to be anybody here for this particular uh, reading, so. So if anyone's online wants to speak for this particular issue, please raise your virtual hand. Thank you. Okay. Okay, not seeing anyone. So <coughs> I believe uh, Commissioner Jacobson, our next step is either by a vote or consensus uh, asks staff to bring back uh, a revised version of this ordinance in two weeks. I have, cons I mean, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. okay with that. I have consensus if you do. We have consensus. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, we move on to our next agenda item, which is the 2021 annual rate review report from Thompson Sanitary. And we'll invite you forward. Stealing your Kleenex first. <laughs> <laughs> so Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, I'm Ken Riley. I'm the owner and operation manager of Thompson Sanitary Service. And we're here today to present our yearly uh, rate report. With me is controller Walter Budzig. And Walter comes to us with 22 years of experience in the solid waste industry. And we're really excited to have him um, 
with us at our company. And before we get into the heavy lifting, if you'd indulge me, and I'll be very quick, but I'd like to just update on some events that we've had in the past, um, what's going on right now, and some things in the future. And I'll be, like I said, I'll, I'll try to be very quick. But first of all, I'd like to just encourage everybody to uh, download our app and, and follow us on Facebook and Instagram, mostly because we're, there's a lot of things that are constantly changing, and that's the best way to get um, information. And most of what I'm going to go through right now is, is based on my sister-in-law, Amy Thompson, who does just a great job with outreach and education. And so as I go through the list, even though Walter and I are sitting in front of you, Amy is really the one that's pulling the, <laughs> the weight on this. She does, but she does a great job. She does. And I, I'm going to just highlight a few. I'm not going to go through the entire list, but just some of the things that I think are very important. And um, this year we participated in Touch a Truck. Um, which was an event put on by the city. We also did the National Night Out with the Newport um, Police Department. Um, Amy recently aided in a recycling presentation um, with MUM citizens in our city. And the Newport Middle School will bring back Green Team this year, which is really exciting. And we're, we're also excited to be able to announce we're going to be able to take all of our seventh graders this uh, February or March to um, Garten in Salem, look to see the path of our waste, uh, follow the waste, and they'll be able to go to PRC and, and Coffin Butte also. And um, I just a shout out to Paul Sykes, um, who does just a fantastic job with our solid waste district. Um, Amy and I were really close to, with him, Amy a little bit more than me, but um, they're organizing a follow the waste for the local officials. I know Katie has shown some interest in that where um, you can go and, and just follow the waste, see where it starts, see where it ends. And it's really, a we've done it several times and it's great. I know there's a lot of energy right now going to the countywide 4th of July cleanup. Um, we've, we've participated, our, our staff painted one of the barrels that will be out on the beach, which was a lot of fun. We did it for Cinco de Mayo for our employees. It was, it was really a fun deal. Um, Amy's been working with uh, City Parks for uh, anti litter signs. And, and then probably the most exciting thing that we're going to do, and it touches most of our county customers residentially, is that we're swapping our Monday and Friday routes, um, which the reason behind that is pretty simple. Anybody that is from here on Friday, we're in South Beach. Um, it's very difficult to handle South Beach on a Friday afternoon. And so we're we're gonna we're gonna do our uh, current Friday routes on Monday, and our current Monday routes, which are in Agate Beach, which are right next to our office, are gonna be our Friday routes. So efficiency should go up dramatically. So we're really looking forward to that. That's gonna be the week of May twenty third. Um, so if you're not a Monday or Friday, it doesn't affect you. <laughs> I just want to be clear. Okay. We've had some, we had we had some phone calls saying what we, what happens on Tuesday. Nothing happens Tuesday. If you're a uh, Tuesday uh, customer, nothing not happens. <laughs> <laughs> you're still a Tuesday customer. So it's only going to affect uh, Monday and Friday residential customers. And so um, and really, that's all I have. I'm going to introduce Walter, and he, he can give you a, a background of a little bit of his history, and, and we can get into the nuts and bolts of the, the rate review. So, Walter. So, my name is Walter Budzik, and I uh, am the newest member of the Thompson Sanitary Team. I've been here almost three weeks now. Oh, oh well, so welcome. Yeah. So, we threw him into the fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Here we are. Um, so, uh, like Kevin said, I, I did, I'm from the Grimble, um, and I started in the waste industry in 2000 with a company named Western Oregon Waste. Um, in 2003, I became the fleet facilities manager for Western Oregon Waste, and I was a shop manager for about five years. Um, in 2008, uh, I moved into the finance department um, and worked for our CFO named Joe Cook, who you may uh, or may not know. Um, and uh, I got my accounting cert certificate from Linfield at that point. Um, and in 2011, Western Oregon Waste was acquired by a company called Ecology. Um, and I became the accounting manager at that point. I was the accounting manager for the last 11 years uh, with Ecology. So um, I tell you this uh, not because I want to talk about myself, um, but to give you a little background, a little insight. So at the end of my tenure there, um, we had 19 jurisdictions that we did financials for and managed uh, rate contracts a lot like this one. So I'm familiar with the process. 
Um, I've testified before in, in rate hearings like this. Um, I've produced projected financials, uh, those kinds of things. So um, I'm new to Thompson's, but I'm not new to process here. And um, I'm here to answer the questions that, that you guys might have about a rate application. So um, as I'm sure I, you guys know, uh, our rates are governed by an operating ratio. So this is a ratio of uh, our allowable expenses to our revenues. Um, and we're allowed a, uh, a, a, um, a range of that operating ratio, so between 85 and 91%. Um, last year, uh, we have projected to be uh, inside that range. And so we, we saw no rate, up, no rate increase at that point. Um, and you can see that in the packet uh, in front of you. Um, our job this year is to project where we're going to land in 2022. Um, uh, we are allowed to take 85% uh, of the current CPI as an increase, provided that that, uh, that increase doesn't push us outside of the operating ratio range. Um, sadly, this year, uh, we're projecting that uh, even though uh, CPI is high um, and there's a cap on that CPI of 6%, that the application of that 6% rate increase will be insufficient to get us back into the operating ratio range. Um, a number of reasons for this, um, as I'm sure uh, everybody has heard these kinds of reasons, but um, fuel uh, is one of the major reasons. Uh, labor is another huge reason. We uh, at Thompson's recently had a uh, an outside company come in and look at our rates, uh, our wage, our wages, um, to make sure we were at market. Um, and we had a little bit of uh, we had to raise some rates a little bit from um, on a few uh, individuals. Um, so we, we did a little catch up there. And then as, as I'm sure everybody knows, uh, wages are going up significantly. Um, uh, CPI is right now at about eight and a half. So that is also applied um, on items that aren't labor or disposal or fuel. Um, so uh, like I said, uh, it looks like the 6% cap will be insufficient to, to cover the need for, uh, for the revenue requirement this year. So we're seeking that. 9.88% rate adjustment, which brings us back into the targeted range at 88% for our operating ratio. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions. Could you review just briefly a little bit more about the rate review format and you know how it's designed to uh, reflect your actual costs of operation as, as well as a reasonable profit margin? Sure. Um, so uh, at the end of each year, we submit our financials to an outside uh, CPA firm and the review. Um, and that's presented to the council uh, for your review. Um, we then take those results and apply whatever sort of um, uh, uh, increases or decreases or whatever we feel appropriate to project the upcoming rate year financial and results. And then uh, from there, we uh, change the, the, uh, the revenue to uh, arrive at a revenue requirement sufficient to get us back to the targeted range. Um, unless, of course, the application of the CPR, the 85% of the CPI, puts us, keeps us in the range or puts us back in the range. Um, so we would not. We don't necessarily do the revenue requirement computation unless we <clears throat> like this year. So. And this format has been in place, I don't know, Ken, I was trying to remember about 15 years, maybe. Uh, yeah, I think it's at least 15, maybe 17. I think we started in 2003 and it was a multiple year um, project between the, the county and the haulers. And, you know, just in my memory, it seems like uh, one of the many good things about this process is it's allowed for small but consistent rate increases. So uh, are you prepared for the likelihood that uh, an increase of almost 10% is going to bring some sticker shock? And yeah, I, 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 think it's, I think that we are prepared for that. And I think ultimately, and Walter touched on it a little bit, Ultimately, where we missed was last year with not having a rate increase. Um, you know, we weren't, we didn't 
forecast the how fuel was going to affect it at the end of the year and, and and it just we missed you know and unfortunately we should have come in last year and we didn't so it's it's hard to catch up okay. yeah questions I, or comments i do have a couple papers, i have yeah. a couple of questions looking at your um, rate sheet so <clears throat> excuse me the residential service that includes recycling and compost right that rate um under the additional services, what is enhanced service? You want to take that? Yeah. yeah. So um, we have a couple of different um, services. One is enhanced, which is a customer that doesn't put their can to the curb, but wants a um, assist. Assist. Yeah. So our rate is based on everybody bringing their cart to the curb. If you and we offer all sorts of different options. So if and obviously if if there's a handicap issue that doesn't come into play. But um, if they want an ex extended service, maybe they don't want to bring it to the curb. They want us to walk up to their um, mm -hmm. garage to get it. Then we will do that. And there will be an additional. So that requires your driver getting out. Right. Okay. Exactly. Got it. Thank you. Um, the other question I had on the just in general was um you know lid latches i think doll maybe has a product or something for that i don't think thompson's does we actually do oh, you now do? Okay. And I, I probably should have added that to my report yes uh okay. we do have uh some latches that are just came in and we have not even implemented them yet and we also have bear cards that um for an additional fee um and and i noticed in my neighborhood there's a bear back so um i would anticipate we'll be getting some phone calls um that the you know will keep the bear out of your garbage cans so we do we haven't implemented the latches okay. we, they did just come in recently um and uh we do have bear cards that will help keep the bears out of the garbage cans awesome yeah because I, boy, and there's nothing I hate more than coming out and realizing that my lid flew open and there's <laughs> trash all over my street. So, anyways, um, that's all the questions that I have. Yeah. So, what's procedurally? What's our next step? Bringing this back uh, next week's meeting or another future meeting? To I think, I think Tim. I don't know if you want to Mr. Johnson in two weeks or next week for public input. Uh, typically, we were going two weeks, so we would be bringing this back just before the 1st of June, May 25th, May, May 25th, uh, whereby you would and then, and then identify those price increases over the 30 day period for those to take effect July 1. Am I correct, correct gentlemen? Correct. Correct. So that's how the schedule would work. Would that timeline work for you in terms of just getting notice out to the public and other steps to prepare? I would guess yes, that. Okay. Yeah. Then let's bring this back in two weeks. I have consensus for that. Yep. Okay. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Chair, yeah. could you let Jerry Lindstrom know that we have constituent input coming at the end of the agenda? Okay, Mr. Lindstrom, we do have constituent input uh, coming at the end of the agenda. We've got one more presentation right now, and I'd like to invite. Ryan Pope, the Executive Director of the Cascades West Council of Governments, come forward and tell us about this nifty new COG product, which is a, kind of an annual report on your impacts in Lincoln County, the COG's impacts. Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioners, for the record. I'm Ryan Bode. I am the Executive Director of the Oregon Cascades West Council of Governments. And um, when I came on board just not quite two years ago, some of the feedback that I got was that as a council of governments, um, well, if you're familiar with council of governments, you know that if you've seen one of them, you've seen one of them. Uh, and we do a variety <laughs> of services all across the board. And um, being able to kind of tell our tale about our impact in the community is one of the things that's really been lacking. I have had the honor and privilege of working with each of the commissioners on different issues that uh, our organization touches, but this is our kind of first swath at um, trying to consolidate some of the information so that you or constituents that you talk to have a better understanding of kind of what the COGS footprint is in the region. 
The information is there. You have it electronically. I brought some uh, printed copies that are slightly prettier uh, for to adorn your desk or to hand out to anybody <coughs> um, who may have interest in them. And um, so I won't kind of belabor the content that's in there. Um, as you will see in here, our as an organization, our largest footprint is really on um, senior and disabled services. And most of the work that we do, uh, or at least the largest chunk of work that we do in terms of our workforce is uh, touching its uh, seniors and people with disabilities and impacting their lives. That being said, we have a large footprint it, with our community services programs, probably the one that people are most familiar with is Meals on Wheels. And you will see that um, quite impressively, and during the middle of the pandemic here in Lincoln County, we uh, delivered over 60,000 meals last year. Um, that is a lot of people getting some social interaction that they otherwise wouldn't have had, and also getting a nutritious meal. There's plenty of work for us to be doing, and I would like this to serve as kind of a baseline report. Uh, it's, a, it's a place for us to talk about where it is that we're moving, where it is that we're growing, <coughs> what is the right business line for us to be in, and are we doing the right thing? So over the next couple of years, I anticipate that this will expand and grow. Now, what's not in this report that I would take a moment to share is that uh, our organization is also, with the variety of services that we're doing, it's really important that we invest in kind of a strategic notion on how it is that we want to grow over the next couple of years. So we have brought on a strategic planning partner. Uh, the contractor is um, Pivotal. They've done a lot of work with state agencies in Oregon and a number of other uh, agencies nationally. But they just came on board two weeks ago. Um, but the reason why that's important is you all as commissioners will be asked to provide input if you would like into our three year strategic plan. I know Chair Hall is also our board chair and we will be engaged in uh, not just a individual opportunity to provide feedback, but an ongoing steering portion of where that goes over the next couple of years. Um, but I would, this is my first time being in front of you, and I am really thrilled to be here in person as a lifetime social worker, being off of the Zoom environment and in person is really, really exciting. Uh, but I would entertain any questions that you have. Commissioner Jacobs, any questions? You know, I don't really have any questions, you know, other than to say I think it's, um, I'm glad to hear that you're doing some strategic planning because I think, um, at least when I was a new commissioner, you know, it was very hard to understand what you guys did, not necessarily programmatically, but it sort of seems like a compilation of things other people didn't want to do, you know, that kind of came to the cog and yeah. you graciously took all that. So we are grateful um, that that's not a knock by any means, but, um, you know, I think sometimes it's difficult to know what your role or interest in certain things would be because you do have such kind of a, a potluck of different things that you do. It's hard to kind of know where your hands want to be. And so I think that's helpful moving forward so that we know, okay, you know, this is the kind of stuff that the COG is interested in working on or doing, or here's where it's worth a phone call to see if we can partner. And yeah. these things are things we should find other partnership for. So I think that's... Um, I think that'll be really helpful moving forward. And it seems like there's also been, you know, a, a change, at least in the three years I've been here from more kind of economic development focused to be a little more social service focused or, or both. And so again, I, I'm happy to hear that you are going through a planning process and doing some strategic plannings. I think that will be really helpful, not just to you as an organization, but to all the partners you work with for us to better understand you know, what it is you do and, and have, how to help you with the types of things we need to do. So, glad to hear that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, my uh, elevator speech at this point is still would require, you know, kind of an Empire State Building, Sears Tower type of <laughs> journey <laughs> to figure out how I are yeah. clearly articulate yeah. the kind of broadband of services yeah. that we provide. But, and uh, speaking of broadband, and speaking, of, and broadband. speaking of broadband, thank you for taking on our economic development grant that we received for broadband for 
uh, several counties for a partnership. You know, we felt like we were after we received that we're really um, lacking the adequate staff capacity for going through a wildfire and stuff to manage that. And so we're really grateful that you all stepped up to manage that um, for us and that we can be a participant in that program and not simply just the grant administrator. So I'm really grateful we did. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We're happy to do it. And for anybody who is watching online, if you weren't aware, um, from a regional perspective of broadband, it was the leadership of the Lincoln County Commissioners that really kicked that off. And so we are uh, thrilled to be uh, assisting in that role and to uh, bring broadband to the rural parts of our region. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks for taking that on. Really appreciate that. Yeah. I don't have any questions. Uh, as you alluded to, Ryan, I'm the chair of the COG board this year. And I've been around long enough that it's actually my second go around in the chair's seat. And I have been part of the board my entire time in office. And, uh, you know, I believe deeply in the value and importance of uh, the work that the COG does. And I just think this is a great tool to help spread the story to more people. So thank you. All right, well, thank thanks you. for your time. Yeah. And now we move on to commissioner reports. Anything, Commissioner Jacobson? Um, I have a couple things. Uh, one is we've kind of discussed it here and there, but I think we really need to uh, have a time on our agenda. Like I know things are you know getting tight. I've, I've seen our draft agendas for the next few weeks, and they're pretty stacked. But we really need to start talking about fireworks. Yes. Um, and you know, looking at some of the. Uh, oh, good. To bring the first. Okay, good. Uh, because looking at what um, to be a pretty dry summer, and so you know, it's hard to say if there's going to be an exact drought declaration in Lincoln County or not. I'm kind of getting the drought committee up and going, but um, I think having those discussions now and having those discussions with Sheriff Landers and others. Uh, instead of having them late June, which is what we did last year, yeah. it's way too late because um, it's not just about, and there's a lot of concern around the enforcement piece, but it's also adequate time to educate the public on, you know, what, what is happening and if they can have fireworks or where they can have them or, or whatever. So, but the first reading will be in April. Okay. Two weeks from today. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, the other thing I was just going to say is um, I, uh, Oh, well, I'm not officially reappointed yet, but in the process of uh, reappointment to another two year term on the Land Conservation Development Commission. So, great. Thanks. I don't have anything for today. So, now we move on to public input. And I know, Mr. Miller, you informed me before the meeting that we have four people who have submitted comment through the smart sheet process. Now we'll open it up for people online, and if you do wish to speak for up to three minutes on any topic, uh, please use your raise hand function now. Okay, it looks like we have Jerry Lindstrom. Um, Jerry, you should uh, be unmuted. Okay, I did. Can you hear me okay? That's we can. fine. Okay, one of the issues when I raised my hand when Thompson's sanitary service was on, and maybe this needs to go to the board. Um, I'm not sure if it's a law or whatever, but I was told that it's mandatory. We have to have a, a compost garbage can and be in charge for it. And if we don't want the compost can, we're still getting charged for it. So I wanted to ask if that's by law, we have to do that. Because if you have no composting, how are you being charged for a service that you don't need? So that's what I want to present to the board. But the other thing that I called in and have note on, if I may, is that I was in April 20th hearing on this uh, Oregon administrative rules that issues that I'm having with the tax assessor's office. No one has contacted me back on that yet. And the other thing which I submitted today, and I hope you guys saw it, is that since there's some issues and go ongoings in that, that I've referred to ORS 308.055, special assessor appointed if assessor fails to act, which the tax assessor's office is doing. And it says in here that if they're not following the law, 
that the county courts or board of commissioners could appoint a special appraiser to take a look at my property. And that's all I have at this point of, of that is that's why I'm asking this board. And I've also sent it on to the uh, Department of Revenue for because that's what it states in here as well for a special assessor appointed because it's it's clear with the information I provided and there's plenty more of it. I just didn't know how to provide it more to that. The tax assessor's office is not following the Oregon administrative rules by law and it does stay by law and there's penalties and fines if it's not being done. So that's my comment. I appreciate you guys' time. And April 20th hearing, when I raised my hand, I, I didn't hear who was gonna check on this, where it was supposed to go, who was gonna contact me. But at, at this point, no one has, and I've contacted the tax assessor's office again, asking for legal reasoning why they're not and still haven't received anything. So I appreciate you on those two things and hoping to hear back on these two issues of the ORS and the Oregon administrative rules not being followed by the tax assessor's office. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Can you see anyone else online? Taking a look. No, oh, it looks like that's all we have today. Is anyone signed up uh, for in person testimony? Oh, nobody signed up today. Double checking. Nope. And then right. can you, one more thing, can you show us the, where the written comment is? Yes. Thank you. Stand by. And online, if we go to county's website and go into the meeting of the day. We can see it here under supporting documents and there are four written items today. Okay, thank you, Casey. And the public input that's received in the week prior to the meeting is on the page for each meeting. Yes, yes it is. It's archived there for all of time. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you, everyone. All we have left before adjournment is to remind people that uh, the Board of Commissioners will have its office staff meeting at 9 o'clock next Monday morning, May 16th, and our regular public meeting on Wednesday, May 18th at 10 o'clock. Uh, both of those taking place in this room with access over Zoom. Until then, we're adjourned. Okay.